like many things, I am a casual fan of Sonic the Hedgehog. Though even for fans of that franchise, I'm niche of niche. This is because, well, I suck at the 2D games. Seriously, I got my introduction to the series because of Sonic 2 and 92, and the animated series that followed with the Archie's comics-influenced universe. But to this very day, I've never actually beaten that game, as there are later stages I'm just not able to pass. The same is said of the other 2D games where I generally suck at them. That is, with the sole exception to the GBA game Sonic Advance, which I'm actually fairly decent at, though more out of necessity than true capability. Instead, my real thrust in part of the fandom ended up being part of two primary sources. This game, and a certain collection of sprite comics on a website and forum I used to hang out on, The Middle Ground. Now, The Middle Ground is actually still around as a sprite comic site, with its primary contributors still posting to this day, and they've been at it for nearly two decades now. I probably should catch up with some of them, as honestly when I moved to having a full-time job in 2017, I had less time to spend around the site, which was only compounded by the site's users moving to spending more time on Discord servers, and frankly, I've never been good on Discord, so that was part of why I just stopped engaging. It wasn't a conscious choice, but there are just only so many hours in the day, and honestly, I miss some of the people I used to hang out with from there. Which, for those who have watched my earlier communal streams of various stuff, had a bunch of guest commentators who I met and were friends with from that site. Hell, I first got into streaming and doing the reviewer thing because of people on that site making me aware of the medium of expression, and me step-by-step -step learning the process from their encouragement. And 11 years later... Here I am. And hey, while some of the stuff in the comics is definitely viewable as cringe, even by the maker's own admission, that site was an overall positive place They didn't have to deal with a bunch of the assholes making such social spaces toxic. Hell, for those who are bigger fans of Sonic than myself, well, Evan Stanley, one of the best artists and occasional writers for the later Archies and also IDW Sonic comics, actually started out as a fan creator herself with her webcomic Ghosts of the Future, which is still hosted over on the middle ground, and got her current job with them after her work was recognized in a contest Archie held. But yeah, that's a bit of my background connection with Sonic. It's been as much through these forums and friends where Sonic was as much a background feature since, well, Sprite Comics and those who made them love to use Mega Man and Sonic characters for them, as was how we were just there to riff and make fun on stuff. But in general, there was a certain reverence for some material over others, and one of the few things most of us could agree on was a love of Sonic Adventure 2 and all that came from it. And thus, in the 20th anniversary year of the game's Western release, here we are. And here I am talking about it. Well, okay, technically that anniversary was last year. Sonic Adventure 2 was the 10th anniversary game for the Sonic franchise, originally released worldwide for the Sega Dreamcast in June 2001. Thanks to Sonic growing to becoming the mascot character of Sega due to the character's first game being a pack-in game with the Sega Genesis, well... Basically, everyone that owned a Sega product ended up becoming a fan of Sonic. His games sold that well even past the point they stopped being packed and exclusive for consoles, and a high selling point for Sega overall. However, Sega's newer and newer consoles just weren't able to keep up with what Nintendo was doing that was more innovative than the competition, and the just sheer computing power of the PlayStations 1 and 2. Coupled with not that many exclusive games that people wanted to play and were engaged in playing, well, Sega saw the writing on the wall and shifted to just being a game developer and retired from consoles after discontinuing the Dreamcast, and at the very least began exporting what games they could to the other consoles. The Nintendo GameCube was the closest in specs to the Dreamcast and was overall a solid system. Thus, eight months after the game launched on the Dreamcast, an enhanced port of the core game, Sonic Adventure 2 Battle, was made available for GameCube owners, and it was in this forum that I first experienced the game. My eventual stepbrother Tony, as his mom didn't marry my dad until I was in college, ended up getting the GameCube as a Christmas gift in 2001. And in 2002, after my mom had moved us to Indiana, I was sent to my dad's for the summer. It was not a pleasant summer, as I and my eventual stepmother do not get along at all to this day. But one of the games Tony and I were able to get into that summer to survive it was Sonic Adventure 2 with the others amusingly being Digimon World 3 that I reviewed eight years ago now, and the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game when it started being distributed. And, yeah, I really feel that informs my affection for it, as it was a good escape that Tony and I were able to bond over 
when we weren't having to deal with his mom driving us to places we just did not want to be. And you know what? It actually was a good choice too, as even 20 years later, Sonic Adventure 2 is still on the short list of good 3D Sonic games. Which just really do not have a good track record in that respect. While I've not engaged much with Sonic the last several years, well, I think there are more bad Sonic games in just the 3D era of the franchise than there have been good ones overall, and I know that's an opinion many share. Everyone knows how bad Sonic 2006 is, as well as the storybook games in Sonic Boom Rise of Lyric. And the less anyone talks about the Bioware game Sonic Chronicles The Dark Brotherhood, the better. I personally have a deep visceral loathing of Sonic Heroes. I have the PS2 version, which is apparently the worst release. Though paradoxically, I have a soft spot for the sidequel game Shadow the Hedgehog because, well, I really like that character. Oh, and I'm not the only one on that. Though I don't think anyone is as big a Shadow fan as Japanese voice actress Aoi Yuki. ね。<笑><笑><笑><笑> You have no idea how much I laughed at Aoi Yuki acting like that, considering all the stuff she's been prolifically in the last decade. She voices Sticks the Badger in the Japanese dub of Sonic Boom, by the way. Yet another Ascended fangirl allowed to go squee. But yeah, the last Sonic game to date was Sonic Forces in 2017 which was widely considered yet another in a chain of bad games. The consistent problem with most of them past Sonic Adventure 2's release was they were built on either faulty premises, haphazard game mechanics, shoved the character in directions that didn't make sense, such as the whole werewolf thing, or otherwise the content itself had terrible quality control, meaning the games themselves were bugged to hell. The last positively received game, Sonic Mania, Took it back to high-speed 2D side-scrolling by a developer that started as a fan making his own custom games that Sega paid to make a game for them. And the only other two post-SA2 games that people generally like were Colors and Generations, both of which tried to dot every I and cross every T that the makers could. At least until Colors got the remaster treatment where that didn't end up happening. It kind of makes sense why there hasn't been more past that. Even though the Sonic comics content are thriving over with the IDW, and the live action movie in 2020 was actually really good. No, seriously, the film explored aspects of Sonic's character that aren't often well addressed. The backstory stuff dug deep into the mythos from the Archies and IDW releases. The standard human cast members you expect for these things to fill space weren't annoying and had depth to them, and a good buddy cop dynamic for it. The jokes were actually funny. And Jim Carrey stole the show as Ivo Eggman Robotnik and fit everything needed for the mad scientist portrayal. With, of course, the expected Jim Carrey spin on it that helped make the film, while flawed, just overwhelmingly endearing. Having a sense of humor to it, an actual exploratory arc for the title character, and a tangible story all helped viewers and fans take the movie on its own merits. In contrast to other video game adaptations where a lot of them fail as they don't really try to get the story setting or characters right at all. Showing that there was more than lip service to doing such rights and exploring aspects other content didn't, it got the goodwill to get a sequel out of it. But back on point with what I'm actually supposed to be reviewing, yeah, the adventure games are widely considered as the high point with regards to the Sonic games with everything after just not achieving the same success. Adventure 2 being the more polished of the pair. And the adventure name is apt, as it really does feel like a globetrotting adventure as you progress through the stages. Hell, one of the best aspects of the game is actually in its replay mode, which had a series of additional non-story-centric missions that allowed you to more deeply explore the environments constructed around each stage. When I take time to go through the alternate modes, and even the very hard mode difficulty, I had fun as these stages were all truly made to be explored, and not just run through as fast as possible. Sure, you could still speedrun it all, and the game encouraged you to do just that, with the movement speeds the characters adding to that feeling as, well, the janky early CGI renders helped infer the faster speeds were happening as the screen would blur, 
as opposed to the later ones where you just didn't get that feeling of speed without losing control. While some of the stages could just be ridiculous, Radical Highway immediately comes to mind, some of these others more felt like places that could potentially exist or be thrown together from flotsam, or a stylistic representation of where someone would set up shop. Instead of being a comparatively warped, who the hell would make something like this in reality, sort of meat grinder. What especially helped the experience, at least for me, is because I wasn't so attached to just playing as Sonic as other people are, I got real enjoyment out of the fact that the game is an ensemble, with Sonic's companion characters Knuckles and Tails being able to join in on the action in their own specialized stages. Knuckles as a treasure hunter trying to find certain artifacts hidden throughout his stages that you have to quickly search for, and Tails piloting his own transforming plane robot to tackle the robots of their antagonist Eggman and his schemes, as well as fight the man's own Battlewalker robot. But then there's the thing that entirely flipped the script, which once more kept the game as unique from all that has come before and after it. The Dark Story. Adventure 2 was the first game in the series that allowed you to play through the game as antagonist characters in their own dedicated levels and story branches, with a larger narrative storyline for the game woven between both sides. The Dark Story setting up the scheme on their side, with the hero story then being the reaction to and counterattack to resolve the machinations elaborated on in the Dark Story. And by playing both sides to completion, you unlocked the last story, which brings the entire tale to its full culmination. While that's more expected to see nowadays that any type of game have some story to it to justify why things happen in varied places, even in fighting games, well, as a just as teens gamer whose only prior experience with Sonic was the Genesis games I sucked at, in an early 90s cartoon, this approach blew my mind back then as for the first time since that earlier cartoon, the cast had actual character to them. And it wasn't just Speedy Blue Hedgehog and a Kitsune have to stop a guy using wildlife as batteries from taking over the world. Of course! But instead, the reality of a goofball thrill seeker just looking for the next big adventure and coming in conflict with an obsessive inventor alongside his own adventuring ward, wannabe girlfriend, and rival more focused on guarding his lost civilization's treasure. I think that's what a lot of people liked about the adventure games. What we'd been told was true about the cast in manuals that explained the story of the game, if they even got those with the game, used markets usually didn't have them, or said in the comics and other media, was finally, for the first time, truly in the games. Sure, the voice directing wasn't that great for either adventure game, so the voice actors really weren't that good with the portrayal. Try playing the game with the Japanese audio on sometime, it actually fixes that. And the sound balance issues every version of the game has where the music is louder than the characters when they're trying to talk. But getting that feeling of an immersion, it was just so good. As was the characters first introduced with the game. While Sega tried to expand the mythos and cast for the series to varying degrees of success over the years, the less said of the Chaotix crew the better, quite frankly, the adventure games were honestly the most successful at that. With this leading into the introduction of Knuckles' foil for the game, the treasure-hunting thief and spy, Rouge the Bat, who gets a ridiculous amount of fan service art made for her. I think I'm past the point of judging at this rate. Fans do what you will as long as you're not hurting anyone or inflicting yourself on another as an asshole but it is a factor about the game's legacy. And of course, Sonic's opposite for the game, the being that was developed to be the ultimate life form of the Sonic-verse, Shadow the Hedgehog. <gasps> Shadow the Hedgehog? Hey everybody, look! Shadow's here! Who's he? He's only the second most popular character in the whole canon! And unsurprisingly, on top of the already established characters, the game spends a lot of time getting them integrated into the ensemble, and their introduction is a large part of what drives the story. In which, Dr. Eggman, upon finding some research notes of a Project Ark created by his grandfather, reawakens Shadow from cryostasis in a holding facility of the military organization Gun. Shadow, the eventual culmination of Project Shadow, in an attempt to develop an immortal life form, headed by Eggman's grandfather, Gerald Robotnik, has his own grudge against Gunn and the governments that back the group. As 50 years before, the forces of Gunn invaded where this research was taking place, the Space Colony Ark, and in doing so, slaughtered those that occupied it, including among the victims, Gerald's sickly granddaughter, and by proxy, Eggman's cousin, Maria, whose shadow witness die as she in turn sent him off the station in an escape capsule. 
instead of herself. Haunted by that trauma and kept in isolation for half a century, Shadow quickly offers Eggman whatever he wants, in exchange for gathering the Chaos Emeralds, gemstones that exist on the wavelength of chaotic cosmic energy, which can be channeled through them. And with the seven of them gathered, they can install them into a terminal in Space Colony Arc that will allow them the power to take over the world, or destroy it utterly. For what makes Shadow the ultimate life form is he has the power to freely manipulate chaos energy however he wishes both in the environment, but also with its channeling through gemstones. Chaos Control! This allowing him limited command over time and space itself. Because there's previously just been Sonic as a speedster hedgehog known to the world, this causes Gun to think Sonic's gone rogue, and with his recklessness and self-serving adventure antics in the past, the military thinks he's just started acting out for the thrill of it, trying to take the blue blur into custody, with that not exactly working out for them, and that alerting Sonic in turn to his black and red duplicates that has no sense of humor. And amusingly enough, the game perfectly handles the matter of getting another speedster hedgehog in on things that helps address the Six Ranger problem of a character sharing what seems to be redundant abilities. I found you, Faker! Faker? I think you're the fake hedgehog around here. You're comparing yourself to me? Huh, you're not even good enough to be I'll my I'll make you fake. eat those words! There's no time to play games. Yeah, having the two at odds like this, both vying for the title as a legitimate individual distinct from the other in this manner, it helps sell them. Helped by Shadow not just being a palette swap of Sonic with his quill styled differently and also bearing all those red accents, which ironically kind of reminds me of Vegeta from Dragon Ball if we're being honest here, but also in the way Shadow actually moves on a stage. Now, Sonic has always been shown throughout the series to specialize in two, just two, things, running and jumping. Thus, it's pretty clear all focus should be paid to his legs, with most of his attacks always coming around to either curling into a ball to hit with his body, his head, or his feet. And while for the most part Shadow's move pool for the game has to mostly conform to this due to the limitations of their play modes, well, Shadow, thanks to the cutscenes, always came off more adept as an energy manipulator and not just a runner. And this is best expressed in the game by the shoes he wears or if you keep him moving for long enough, allow him to start skating along the map with use of thrusters built into them, that are powered by the chaos energy Shadow himself is manipulating. And past this game, well, I'd actually have to credit Shadow's specialized game itself for adding to that, where in said game, Shadow ended up using all sorts of weapons, vehicles, and gadgets in addition to his base abilities, whereas Sonic generally keeps to his own core skills. This characterized Shadow as being willing to use any resource that came into his hands to accomplish his goals at the time, and not willing to hinder himself to just what he, himself, could do. Or as a webcomic that was hosted in the middle ground for a time phrased it, Shadow is... THE ULTIMATE BADASS! The ultimate badass rides at 12 miles per hour? Yes! Like I said, we were one of those insular fan groups that weren't self-aware of the flaws in the works. We were willing to make fun of it all ourselves as the opportunity presented itself. The key was just not being an asshole about it, which is unfortunately difficult on the internet. While later Sonic games have tried to branch out what Sonic has as part of his toolkit of abilities, well, a lot of that didn't work out the way the game makers wanted to because most players of Sonic felt that their super parkour free run rodents wouldn't want to do more than just go fast every which way but loose. Even in this game, players resisted using most power-ups and abilities Sonic gained in the game if they could help it, such as the bounce bracelet that let him rebound off of the ground, the magic hand that let him throw a Pokeball to catch and then throw enemies, or even the light speed attack that could turn a spin dash into a mash homing attack that would destroy all enemies in range. Most players really tried to not use these abilities if they could help it, as all they wanted to do was run and evade obstacles outside of when the game would force them to use these abilities as part of the toolkit to getting through stages. Oh, and the game did try its best to get players to learn of and use them. Every character you play as gets power-ups through the course of the game, and a lot of the stages are actually designed to get a player to naturally learn how to use these abilities. All of which was in a way that was much more smartly delivered than the new mechanics of later games. With exception to, at the very minimum, Sonic Colors. 
as people liked the Wisp mechanics that game introduced. At most, the longest-lasting new addition the Adventure Games provided, that was then kept, is the Light Dash, the ability for Sonic and Shadow to run along chains of rings to get around obstacles and open pits that would otherwise be impassable. Anyways, Rouge's part in this in turn is actually as a spy for Gun, sent in by them and keeping the government appraised of what Eggman's doing in hopes they can stop it. And they completely fail in that respect, her helping Eggman and Shadow get Chaos Emeralds from their possession, amidst being in conflict with Knuckles over her own White Whale, the Master Emerald, which Knuckles is the guardian of. And the Master Emerald being able to disable the Chaos Emerald's ability to channel Chaos Energy. Unfortunately, Eggman and Rouge's independent actions trying to obtain it results in Knuckles having to smash it, with Rouge and Knuckles' stages being focused heavily around collecting the shards so they can eventually put it back together, as Knuckles broke it in such a way that Chaos Energy can resemble it. This keeps Knuckles in turn on his own away from everyone until later in the game, but playing into it due to the importance the Master Emerald plays in stopping Team Dark's plans. All while Tails and Amy have to stage a jailbreak to rescue Sonic, at the same time, Team Dark's trying to get Gun's Emeralds. It's actually here, though, that we run into one of the few continuity snafus the game has with later material, in that the cell that Sonic was imprisoned in was the same one Gerald Robotnik was imprisoned in himself, which, if you pay attention to what is written there, actually details experiments on Shadow that took place at this installation and details upon it the dangers that are being held up on Space Colony Arc. The whole snafu about that is, from content from the game itself, it was implied that Gerald Robotnik was in that cell until the day of his death. So the question was raised, well, how did he set up the Arc for his big grand revenge scheme? And it's the part that had to be slightly retconned and clarified that Gerald wasn't immediately taken into custody following the Ark incident, and driven mad by Maria's death to set up the means by which the entire world would suffer, brainwashing Shadow to believe that Maria's last words were encouraging him to lash out at humanity for what Gunn did. That memory that's motivating him? It's a falsehood Gerald stuck in his head, and thus sealed him up for those who could follow through on his wishes to find him, which is where Gunn came in, arrested him, and set up shop inside and repurpose his research installation as their own, while making sure Shadow himself stayed sealed away. Thus explaining both the writing on the walls, and why Shadow was buried down there, and why Shadow would want to commit mass murder for the death of an innocent, sickly girl that was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Shadow's focus game goes a bit more into this, with the genes that made Shadow immortal coming from literal aliens. But that is a story for another day. Anyways, with all but one Chaos Emerald in their possession, Eggman has enough power to arm the Eclipse Cannon on the Ark, blowing a chunk out of the moon as a warning shot to the world to surrender or die. As Miles, Tails' Prowler is in possession of the last Chaos Emerald they need, and Tails has spent his time experimenting with Chaos Tech and developed a synthetic gemstone that simulates a Chaos Emerald in a more flawed form. Team Hero thus deciding to try and install the synthetic emerald into the power chamber of the cannon to cause it to feed back and explode, disabling Eggman's ability to threaten the world with this device, and Knuckles in the interim getting the Master Emerald shards back to use it to depower the other emeralds in case that fails. Thus the fight takes everyone to space, and the simultaneously most creative and yet challenging stages of the game. Which is where I should get into the stage design aspect again. And like I said, every stage is its own adventure with how distinct they are from one another. My favorite is of course City Escape, to the point I love it more than Green Hill Zone. And everybody loves Green Hill Zone. Hell, they remade Green Hill Zone in 3D as a completion bonus for this game! But what helps with progression through the game is every stage not only does something different, being reliant on different game mechanics it is teaching you, especially if a given stage gives you access to a power-up that grants the character a new ability, the Sky Rail stage for Shadow is heavily focused on learning to grind well. The Pumpkin Hill stage and Egg Quarters learning how to dig with Knuckles. The Aquatic Mind Knuckles equivalent for breathing underwater. Eggman and Tails both have stages built around learning how to glide with their mech's flight units. And all the space levels for the characters become culminations of learning from all the previous stages' mechanics. But adding in the complication of everything they need to do being out in space. Now a lot of people hate the space levels and I gotta admit, Sonic and Shadows, where they have to literally grind along the outside of the space colony 
ended up having to deal with the screwy gravity outside. Those are stress tests, as one wrong slip at the wrong moment can send you careening off into the pitch black void. Not help that, well, this was an early 2000s 3D game, meaning the controls aren't exactly sharp where you can stop on a dime or land on a pin. Even Sonic games years past that would struggle with that, but they're not so loose that you can't adapt to it. But you kind of need enough line of sight to try and line up where you're supposed to hit, and the game is forgiving enough that it's not asking you normally to be accurate enough to land on a pin. But when you're moving really fast as happens in the space stages, or have to take blind leaps of faith, jumps into the void to reach something on the other side, well, sometimes even minor movements to try and reorient yourself out here could spitball into being completely out of the orientation you need to be in. Fortunately, the design of the stages does allow you to use environmental objects to try and catch yourself if you can, but it's half and half out there whether that will work. Both Shadow and Sonic stages out here, on top of the rails, play heavy focus on reorienting their personal gravities to walk up or down large objects and structures, and even someone experienced with all the prior mechanics can struggle out here. But honestly, I've been playing this game for so long that it's not that big a deal to me anymore. The same with Rouge and Knuckles' final treasure hunt stages that require they climb huge structures and then hunt through cargo containers and asteroids to find them. People hate them, but I honestly find it fun, especially now that it doesn't take me a literal hour to hunt through them as it did when I was younger. With clearing those, though, each of the paired characters have a final confrontation with their opposite, Sonic and Shadow having a race to the finish where you have to avoid each other's energy attacks, Knuckles and Rouge having a cage match atop a door to an open pick, Knuckles ends up saving Rouge from in a cutscene, one that's kind of silly when you remember she has wings, and Eggman and Tails face off after Eggman appears to eject Sonic into space. All of these boss fights are annoying. While prior boss encounters have some type of strategy to each of them, these are all just drawn out brawls. With Knuckles and Rouge, you just need to outlast the other and make sure you have one score ring left so you don't lose a life. With Sonic and Shadow, staying ahead in the race means you can't hit, but also can't hit your opponent. But if you go too slow, you could fall off the collapsing track. And with Tails and Eggman, you're just shooting one another. With the disadvantage that Eggman has twice the health Tails does after you get his Eggwalker's armor upgrade that makes that specific one a pain to clear. Honestly, half the time, I'm not even sure how I win the bouts with this. I just seem to avoid enough strikes on my character to get the win. And the specific means to do so for fighting Sonic or Shadow with the other is to just slow down, charge a spin dash, and wait for the opposite to begin charging an energy attack, during which the character is left wide open for you to strike them. Do this to each of them, and you clear the final stages of the Hero and Dark stories. Both sides respectively seeming to come out on top, but ultimately neither are, as the events of the last story are triggered. Where it's revealed that inserting the Glass Chaos Emerald into the Ark's power core, has turned the station into a massive chaos energy bomb. That though Sonic and crew succeeded in disabling the Eclipse Cannon, it's not going to matter as now the station is falling out of orbit, and when it makes planetfall, the entire Earth will blow up. Thus, it is up to both teams to team up and use their respective skills to unlock the security doors to the inner chambers of the colony so Knuckles can take the Master Emerald down there and shut the Chaos Emeralds off. After which, Eggman can regain control and reorient the colony. After all, he doesn't want to destroy the world. He wants to rule it because he believes he knows better how to fix the world than everyone else does. Which is why he makes everyone into robots, right? Seriously though, emphasizing that reading of character with Jim Carrey's portrayal was much of what helped his version work. I've always found the last story stage something of a right pain, but it's supposed to be. It's supposed to throw everything at you in order to bar your way and prevent you from undoing the locks. And, hey, that's when a stage like this is fine to do that. It is an interim stage becoming a complete wall of progress that's a bigger deal to me than the last stages being overtly difficult. It doesn't mean I particularly care for some of the challenges and traps in this one, but it is more reasonable to be obstructive than many other stages could claim to be. And then there's the freaking Bio-Lizard! I fucking hate fighting this thing. See, at this point, Shadow's woken up from what he was brainwashed to do and remembered Maria's true wish to help and protect people. Thus, he is all in on making up for his massive mistake by fighting himself, the prototype of Project Shadow, to clear their path. This is all good narrative stuff, but then you get to the actual fights and the boss battle forces you to wander blindly in a loop around the Bio-Lizard, 
unable to see what's in front of you as you move Shadow away from the Bile Lizard until such a time it needs to rest you can strike at its life support system. It wouldn't be so bad if the arena was just a simple ring, but there are two water tributaries that run in between the platforms, and if you don't jump over those, it's an automatic loss as you're either sucked down out of the stage into death, or straight into the Bile Lizard and can't escape. You can't see where the life rings are placed until you're already past them, and when the Bile Lizard moves itself, you're then blocked off from getting them if you haven't managed to get a supply. Worst, its secondary attack involved throwing gravity bombs that are often impossible to dodge, and lastly, homing eggs that you both need to avoid, and use a homing attack on to hit the life support system later in the fight. If it were a few of these mechanics, there'd be less of an issue. But moving blindly on top of all of that, I have gotten good at everything else in this game, with exception to this one fight. Seriously, every time I play through this game, I end up wanting to avoid it, as I don't think I've ever beaten it in less than half an hour of repeated rematches with the damn thing. I just... the other bosses throughout the game are mostly fair, each character getting two or three boss fights to them between the gunfighter jets, the opposite team opponent, or a unique battle each can encounter throughout the course of things. With exception to the second Eggman fight being uneven after you get his armor upgrade, they're mostly fair. But this, even for a second-to-last boss, this thing is insufferable, and I loathe trying to get through everything it has. With this, Knuckles shuts down the Chaos Emeralds, but unfortunately the Bio Lizard has a contingency program stored within it, and having absorbed enough Chaos Energy itself to complete Gerald's plan, throws itself onto the main gun of the satellite and starts dragging it down itself. But with the Chaos Emeralds retrieved, it allows Sonic and Shadow to finally team up, and end this with both of them being infused with Chaos Energy into Super Sonic and Shadow. And yes, this is where Shadow even more looks like Vegeta. Compared to the Bio-Lizard's first encounter though, the final hazard is far, far easier, requiring you to hit the boils that are surging with Chaos Power to destroy the Bio-Lizard. Each hit you succeed with, swapping which character you're using to hit them, as long as you don't run out of rings to power the Super Transformation. With any hit you take from the final hazard's defense is just knocking you back and eating some time. But as you don't have to worry about death until you massively screw up, it is a much, much easier brawl. With it out of the way, Sonic and Shadow use the last of their chaos power and super form transformation to teleport the arc back in orbit. But unfortunately, Shadow burns more of his own, and his power slips from him, falling into the atmosphere, lost beyond grasp of recovery the ultimate penance for what he almost did, and brought about. At least until Sega realized they had a super popular character on their hands and showed the guy was actually immortal, thus brought him back to become part of the true ensemble of the series. But, for now... Sailor, Shadow, the Hedgehog. Anyways, this game is great and remains a high watermark for Sonic fans. And hey, Sega has kept it in circulation, with more recent HD remasters that, sadly, muck up the audio balance even worse than the GameCube release did, which is annoying. As well, I absolutely love the music to this game, to the point I actually do own the physical soundtrack for it, and I don't, can't even say that for Chikayo Fukuda's music, I never found any of the .hack OSTs. Well, sound balance between dialogue, sound effects, and the actual stage music tracks is important. And if a game isn't going to give us the option to adjust them ourselves, they need to not conflict with one another. Outside of the Bile Lizard and some stages having some minor glitches and bugs that don't overtly impede progress throughout the game, that is honestly the biggest problem with it. The rest is otherwise fun and worth an afternoon to run through. Hell, they did a lot to encourage replay as well, as I didn't even talk about the Chow Garden, where you can raise your own Chow space babies and take them through a bunch of challenges in their own dedicated minigames. Even breed unique ones over time by giving them little animals or chaos power cores you can collect throughout each of the stages. This honestly is a fun minigame, and I've actually managed to create some pretty high-level chows thanks to the GameCube release of the game being cross-compatible with the GBA game Sonic Advance. Raising chows ends up being a big incentive to replay the game again and again, and clear the extra mission stages to build up your ring supply and find the animals and items needed to raise the best chows. Though sadly, I've never been able to obtain the ultimate hero, dark and neutral chows that are actually possible to be born. Honestly, even without doing the extra missions forever, I still just really enjoy returning to this game every couple years for a casual play weekend. As it reminds me, not of simpler times, 
but the simple need to endure through tougher times, and of friends I've not much in contact with anymore. It's not the best game out there, this is not aged particularly well in all respects, but it's what I look back on as the ultimate representation of what this franchise once tried to be like, what I liked most about it, and what I'd want to see more of from later games. And I'm not alone in that. We didn't get it. Maybe a Sonic Adventure 3 would have been terrible had it been made. There's no real way to know. What I do know is that even if Sonic's game series is dead for the time being, and Sega's real success the last few years has been the Yakuza games, there's always going to be a niche that enjoys this game, and I don't see that changing anytime soon.